due course uh, set the normal procedures in place for members to discuss and, and debate. Okay, so thank you for that. On matters of the day, uh, Mr Jim Allister has been given leave to make a statement on abortion regulations, which fulfils the criteria set out in Standing Order 24. If other members wish to be called, they should do so by rising in their places and continuing to do so. All members shall be called up to three minutes. Sorry, all members called will have up to three minutes to speak on the subject. I would remind members that I will not be taking point of order on this or any other matter until the item of business has finished. And I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the minds of us all at this difficult time are very much focused on the saving of lives. And therefore, it is all the more abhorrent and perverse that at that very same time we have regulations coming into effect today which will sanction the killing of the unborn. From today, what should be the safest place for an unborn, namely its mother's womb, can become, on a whim, one of the most dangerous places, because we are going to have utterly unfettered, uncontrolled abortion up to 12 weeks. Abortion of babies whose hearts are beating, whose blood is pumping round their bodies, and yet summarily they can be killed, their life snuffed out. Mr Speaker, there is nothing progressive about that. That is regressive in terms of our civilization. And then, of course, up to 24 weeks, you can effectively have abortion on demand. What has happened elsewhere shows us that there is no qualitative test applied. It is effectively abortion on demand. And even after that, right up to the moment of birth, you can have the killing of the unborn. And I don't think I'm permitted to. You can have the killing of the unborn on the pretext of severe fetal impairment. What's that? That could be Down syndrome. That's how shocking this is. So I want to place on record, on behalf of the 79% who responded to the consultation and who were ignored, and this assembly, of course, has never been consulted on this issue. I want to place on record how aghast those of us who believe in life are at this wanton, calculated killing in the womb. And I do urge this assembly to find time to reverse this outrageous, obnoxious situation and to find voice and to give voice to the unborn. Thank you. I call Paul Given. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I hope that the Assembly will find time, uh, given the issue at stake here, because we are talking about life, uh, and that the Business Committee will schedule uh, a motion that was tabled to be heard uh, before these regulations are voted upon at Westminster uh, to give effect to this. 79% of those that responded to this consultation opposed any change in the law in respect of abortion in Northern Ireland. And the British government once again rides roughshod over the will of the people in this country. This is a matter that requires our urgent attention. Uh, abortion up to, in effect, uh, 24 weeks for any reason, and up to term for disability. So no member in this House 
can ever look at people with disabilities and say, proclaim to champion their cause if they are in favour of this. Because up to birth, abortion is uh, going to be allowed now for disability. That is shocking. It is an outrage that that is the case. And then we look at the penalty associated with this. £5,000 of a fine if an abortion takes place outside these regulations. Difficult as it is to imagine that that could be possible, given that this, in effect, is abortion under any circumstances. But the penalty is £5,000. In the Republic of Ireland, it is 14 years imprisonment. But here, it is £5,000. The abortion industry, Mr Speaker, must be delighted that here in Northern Ireland they have the most extreme radical abortion laws anywhere in Europe. It is a travesty that this has been allowed to happen. And so we need, as an Assembly, to take this issue on. We have it within our powers to legislate on these issues. This is a devolved matter, and I will want to see this Assembly giving voice to its opinion, because members opposite have all said they are opposed to the 1967 Abortion Act. This is far worse than the 1967 Abortion Act, far worse, and I can't see how anyone could be able to justify the regulations that are be, being imposed upon us. So, as our society shows how much we value life as a response to COVID-19, taking extraordinary measures to protect life, let us, with the same vigour, with the same determination, seek to protect life of the pre-born, because they have every much a right to life as those that we are now seeking to protect in our response to COVID-19. So, Mr Speaker, for my part and for our, par our parties, we will bring forward uh, proposals in respect of this. We will want to have a motion heard. We will want to seek legislative change so that we have a regime in Northern Ireland that reflects what I believe will be the will of the people on this issue, defending both lives, that of the mother and of the pre-born. Thank you. Could I remind members who wish to speak of the, the would need to raise in their seats? Okay. Paul Frew. Speaker, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, how did we ever get to this place on this day where the lives of the most vulnerable are now in jeopardy? Mr. Speaker, I got into politics to assist the most vulnerable, to make a positive contribution to society in Northern Ireland, this place I love. And with one foul swoop, the British Government and, by extension, the Northern Ireland Office have made a mockery of consultation, whereby 79% of the people who responded, including myself, are ignored. A mockery of legislation and how it should, should be produced, and the time taken to go through each clause and scrutinise it and be accountable for it. A mockery of our health care system. A mockery of how we help and assist the most vulnerable in our society. It is a shame on the British Government and a shame on the NIO that they would bring in guidelines such as these. I give you this commitment, Mr Speaker, that I will fight with every breath I have and every sinew I have in my body to turn these guidelines around, to get to a place where we protect the most vulnerable in our society, where we value people of all ablements and that no one feels under threat, feels that their life is under threat because of disabilities. The most vulnerable people in our society are people yet unborn, but who have a heart that beats and a body that grows. And we are failing those people. We are failing all those people. And I say to the NIO, what you have done here is shameful. What you have done here, imposing this 
guidelines and legislation on the people of Northern Ireland, when you know fine well what the people think, it is well documented throughout the years, even through the decades, where we had a different legislation from the rest of the GB. You know how strong the feeling uh, and mentality is in Northern Ireland around these issues, but yet you ride roughshod over the people's will. We must change this, we must correct this, and we must get into place legislation that protects the most vulnerable and also protects the mother, the father, and the family of the unborn. Our business over the next couple of weeks, Mr. Speaker, is about saving lives. The business of this House is about saving lives, but yet the Department of Health are now having to deal in death. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Kiva Archibald. Um, there is no doubt in anybody's mind that abortion is a very sensitive and emotive issue, but there is also no doubt that the legislation and regulations that we had in place were failing women, um, and that the, in terms of the, the legislation which criminalised women um, for having an abortion that needed to be repealed and it needed to be replaced with legislation that was appropriate, modern and provided for compassionate health care services. Um, Sinn Féin's party policy on abortion is very clear and has been well debated amongst our members. Um, and it states that abortion should be available where women's life, health or mental health is at risk in cases of fatal fetal abnormality and in cases of rape or sexual abuse. It is not possible to legislate for, abort or for rape or sexual crime in a compassionate way and for that reason our, our position is that abortion should be available for a limited gestational period in line with best medical advice. Um, and I think therefore that what has been brought into play is only right and proper that women now can access abortion services without having to travel, that they are free to be able to have health care in a modern and compassionate way. And I think that we would also put on record that we, we believe that the Department for Health needs to consider the circumstances at the minute in terms of access to um, all appropriate health care. Thank you. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, this is clearly an extremely sensitive subject, perhaps among the most sensitive subjects that legislators can debate. I'm glad that uh, healthcare in Northern Ireland for women has evolved to a place where women can access essential services that people in other parts of the UK and now other parts of Ireland can access. I recognise the strength of feeling in the benches opposite. Indeed, I recognise the intense um, dilemma that the issue of abortion presents for families, communities and indeed sometimes individuals themselves. I don't speak um, uh, as a spokesperson um, uh, entirely for my party on this. Others will have other views, and they are um, as entitled to, the, to, the, to those views as I am. But I do state very clearly my own view that while this is an extraordinarily sensitive subject, it cannot be right that women in this part of the UK, in this part of Ireland, are asked to travel to access the most important type of health care, you know, one of the most important types of health care, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, relates to their own bodily autonomy. So I welcome the fact that Northern Ireland is now, for the first time um, as of today, able to provide those services to women. I agree with the previous speaker that it would be good, indeed it's um, essential, I think, to have clarity from the Department of Health on exactly how the regulations and the law will work for women here. Over the next few weeks, we are clearly in a unique situation in relation to COVID-19 coronavirus, so it would be good to have clarity on how that will affect women accessing those services. Let me also say people have reflected on the importance of um, preserving life as, relate, as relates to COVID-19, and again, I reiterate, I understand how sensitive and how deeply held um, people's views are on this. I've had a, a huge amount of correspondence myself over the last few days. But I would, um, I would restate that for many people who are placed in this situation, and it's a situation that I have to acknowledge I will never be placed in because I'm not a woman. Anyone who is placed in this situation will not take this decision lightly, in my view. It's not something that 
is a trifling matter for any woman who's ever placed in the situation of having to consider um, ending a pregnancy. So I don't take the, just the people's moral uh, objections to abortion lightly, but nor do I take lightly the health of women who are um, sometimes in extreme and dire need. And for that reason, I think it is welcome and overdue that the law here has caught up with the rest of these islands, specifically in relation to this Assembly's powers. It's not for me today to make a determination on what the Assembly has competence to do or not. Others will have that debate in days going forward. But I would say that in broad terms, and, I, it, and it is my view, um, that this is a positive step forward for women and girls in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Alan Chambers. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I rise not as the Ulster Unionist Party Chief Whip, and nor am I speaking on behalf of the party. I'm speaking as a, as a member of the Ulster Unionist Party who celebrate their position of conscience on this, uh, on this issue of abortion. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, there have been many days uh, when each of us as MLAs have maligned the day that we got involved in politics and perhaps even regretted it and had low days when which, when, where we've been pained with what has happened and what has not happened. And on the 21st of October was my most painful day as a, a politician of any hue. It was a day when I wasn't able to have my voice heard in this chamber on something which is so important to me. The members have spoke well and given good account of their, their positions, and I just would like to give mine. I'm a, I'm a son, I'm a father, um, I'm a dad, I'm also a foster parent. And me and my wife have fostered many children. And without uh, disclosing the, the difficulties of the background that those children come from, many of them come from the situations that people will use with regard to uh, abortive rights. And I understand the need for parents to, and, and, and women in particular, to have their views heard, and especially, as, as the members pointed out, with regard to health. But there are two lives that matter here, and nothing will shake me from that, that there is two lives that we are talking about. And we need to be sympathetic in how we deal with this subject. But let me say again, Mr Speaker, I regret and was angry that on the 21st of October, for whatever reason, and whoever held us back from this assembly in debating issues pertaining to life and death, saving life and protecting life. We talk about uh, fatal fetal abnormality, we talk about um, rape and incest, and all of those things are important. And this assembly should have had the ability and the maturity to deal with those things sympathetically and appropriately, not through the draconian measures that have been taken here by the NIO the UK government, and as Mr Frew has pointed out, the lack of adherence to the consultation and the high levels of response, probably, I would say, uh, uniquely. There has never been any other issue which has been responded to by the public from Northern Ireland, from all sides of the community. But what really galls me is in relation to how we are going to deal with pregnancies of unborn children with disabilities, severe fetal impairments. There's no list right up to birth. So if you choose to abort a child because of Down syndrome or a club foot or a cleft palate, these regulations will facilitate that. What about the staff? What about their conscientious objection? What about those people who could give a loving home to a child like that? What value do we put on that life? Mr Speaker, I look forward to the day when I do get to say my piece in here and we can legislate like adults and we can discuss this in an empathetic and sympathetic manner and represent everybody who should have a voice in this country. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Andrew Muir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And as I start here, I say this, I'm speaking as a matter of conscience, uh, that this is an issue for a free vote for the party, and uh, I'm speaking as an individual, uh, and also recognise that this is a sensitive issue for many people. My own personal view is, however, that this was to change long overdue and that this day has been we've been waiting quite a while for this day to arrive and women and, and girls have been waiting 
far, far too long for the change that has uh, came about. And I'd like to pay tribute to the courage of so many people who have campaigned for change here in Northern Ireland and brought this issue to the fore. It wasn't easy, and they stepped forward and, and brought these issues to light. Other members within this chamber talk about the fact that they're looking for a different regime. The reality was that this place had an opportunity to vote for a different regime and rejected that. And this Assembly had an opportunity to legislate for these issues and didn't. This place wasn't sitting and that there was legislation passed. The legislation is now in effect. I think it's important that uh, this is given meaning by the Department promptly. Uh, there is gaps in the legislation, such as, for example, in the current situation whereby the inability to travel is causing real difficulties around that, and that will be, has been reported today in the media. Um, there's about 20 or 30 women um, uh, who travel per week across to England, and they have been denied that right. And as a result, there is gaps in legislation in terms of the ability to take the two types of medication at home, and that's something that needs to be given effect. But change has happened. This place had an opportunity to affect that change. It failed. And we're in a new situation here now. And I think we have to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Claire Bailey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and I would like to just thank my South Belfast colleague, uh, Matthew O'Toole, for giving up his seat and allowing me into the chamber today. Um, and the Green Party have long campaigned for equal rights for women across Northern Ireland. Um, we have been denied our rights as UK citizens for 50 years or more, um, and the Green Party welcome the fact that access and reproductive health care is no longer a criminal matter. We never thought that it should ever have been a criminal matter, and we believe that any woman should be able to access an abortion as early as possible and as late as necessary. So today, the regulations on abortion in Northern Ireland are a good step forward and they are to be welcomed. Access to abortion up to 12 weeks is a rel in relatively unrestricted circumstances is a positive move. However, many barriers still exist for access after 12 weeks. It is very discouraging to see that this will create many more difficulties for women here. So we are calling on the Health Minister to put telemedicine in place whereby the required medication can be posted to a home address after initial telephone consultation. This would reduce the impact on the NHS. It would abide by our social distancing protocols and current travel restrictions. Yesterday, the Westminster Government reinstated the use of a telemedicine abortion service in England and Wales. Let's do the same here. And we've also heard yesterday of a young woman from Belfast who could not travel to England for an abortion because of the COVID-19 restrictions and tried to take her own life. Our government must ensure that both patients and medical staff are not placed at unnecessary risk during this pandemic. Millions of women around the world have successfully used abortion pills. It's on the World Health Organization's list of safe medicines, safer than using aspirin, they say. The plight of women and girls requiring access to abortion during this pandemic cannot be ignored. And while this is a good day and a good step forward, it's certainly not enough for access and reproductive health for women when they need it. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jerry Carroll. Mr Speaker, um, yesterday, um, as was previously re referenced, uh, a young woman uh, tried to kill herself as a result of the denial of abortion services. Um, she couldn't travel to England because of the result of the current uh, pandemic. Uh, and the, the reality is uh, the current or the outgoing uh, legislation guidelines has put women at risk for some time. They were guidelines that predated uh, the light bulb, um, and I'm glad they've came to an end. And obviously the coronavirus situation, um, with people obviously following the public health uh, guidance to stay at home and to isolate and socially distance, we will still obviously need uh, access to terminations and abortion services uh, for, uh, for women. And despite some of the, the previous comments uh, made by members, abortion is a fundamentally a health care issue. It is not a criminal issue, and I am glad that that is uh, coming to an end. And whilst obviously these guidelines introduce uh, provision, uh, for some women up to 12 weeks. The reality is that some women uh, will be still placed in dangerous situations as a result of gaps in this guidelines, uh, women in domestic violence situations, uh, women in rural areas, uh, so on uh, and so forth. So I, I would join the call 
uh, for the Health Minister, I would appeal to him to introduce telemedicine care now to allow access to abortion pills uh, for women who have been forced to stay at home as a result of this pandemic. They are doing the right thing by staying at home. Everybody is doing the right thing to stay at home in this situation, and people need to be supported in their health care decisions. And, uh, um, the World Health Organization, who we regularly quote in reference to this uh, pandemic, uh, have said that abortion pills are safe as paracetamol, aspirin, and other regular uh, topics, so we should trust them on it. Um, Obviously, uh, as a result of this previous uh, outgoing guidelines, women have been criminalised uh, for some time, despite the fact that terminations of pregnancy has, has happened for many, many years. And this talk of imposition uh, from members op opposite is quite ironic. Uh, from members who were budding up to the Westminster government uh, for so long. Uh, the truth is this House abdicated its, its responsibility for year after year after year when it comes to legislating for choice for abortion services and to stand by and to trust uh, women. Um, we have heard, obviously, reference being made to the public mood and pu the public view on, on this in terms of abortion services. The reality is the majority of people here are for choice. Every single survey shows that people here are for, are for choice. Life and Time survey, to name one, report and survey after survey shows that people are for choice. So the truth is, this guidelines, this legislation coming in, uh, in some way goes to reflect the public mood for choice, but there's gaps, uh, as has as been mentioned uh, as well. So the public mood is for choice. Uh, the vast majority of health care workers, we should say as well, are for choice or for supporting women to get access to abortion uh, services. So in this time of uh, uh, we're rightly celebrating and recognising the role of our health care workers at this time, trust them to make the right decision around abortion services and abortion access. And that means having a legislative uh, system in place that does not criminalise women, that does not penalise women, and Member trust them to make the correct uh, decision for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Trevor Lunn. Speaker, um, as, as one who has supported this, this uh, type of action over a number of years and who has spoken on it in this House before now, and some of you might remember the occasion when we, um, the two members of the Alliance Party, myself and Stuart Dixon, acting in our own capacity, of course, uh, proposed a, an amendment to the Justice Bill which would have taken care of the issue of fatal fetal abnormality. Uh, that wasn't passed by the House. I think it was a pity at the time, and I, I do wonder where we'd be now if that had been passed. Would Westminster have taken over the whole issue, or would they not? I don't know. But as far as I'm concerned, this, this is a satisfying day. I'm not going to glory in it. It, it. It's a good day for women, for women's rights, for women's right to choose, which we have long camp I have long camp. I'll have to stop saying we, Mr. Speaker. I have long campaigned for. The, the question of the 12 weeks issue. Um, Mrs Archibald is absolutely right. There is no way to legislate for rape and incest situations. We, we, we thought about this at the time of the amendment, and we couldn't come up with a wording. Actually, one of our other members did, but we, actually we even voted against it because it wasn't satisfactory. And uh, the only way to deal with that, in my opinion, is to allow unfettered, if that's the word, termination for the first 12 weeks. That, that takes care of that issue. As far as the rest of the legislation is concerned, I'm comfortable with it, except for one issue, Mr. Speaker, and I agree with Mr. Allister. This issue of severe fatal impairment never should have been in the bill. It's disgraceful. It, it, it opens doors that didn't need to be opened. And if we are going to debate this issue at some stage here, I hope that that would be the first item on the agenda, because it's, it's not right. It's, it's immoral, and I hope we can do something about it. Thank you, and I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's with great sadness that I rise in the House today for two reasons. Firstly, to speak on behalf of the thousands of constituents that have contacted me, and I know other members, on this issue since I became an elected representative. This is an issue that transcends traditional party lines. Traditional orange and green go out the window when it comes to the rights of the unborn. I also rise to speak for those that do not have a voice, the unborn, and particularly here in Northern Ireland, because Northern Ireland has enjoyed a policy, a pro-life policy, in which we can celebrate 100,000 lives living today because of the policies that we had in place. No one in this House 
or indeed in Westminster can tell me that these people have not contributed and add value to society here in Northern Ireland and further afield. It's an absolute shame. A shame on the British government, a shame on the NIO, that in the midst of such uncertain times, such crisis that we're in, that these regulations and legislation can become into effect. Mr. Speaker, I rise as someone that is unashamedly pro-life. I value life from beginning to end. But it seems that while we debate COVID-19 in this place and across this country, many have rose and spoke with great emotion and great sincerity about the life that will be lost as a result of this cursed plague, COVID-19, but yet can turn a blind eye while regulations come into place that end the life of the unborn. They operate a policy simply of seeing is believing. What shame, what utter shame and contempt on not only the British government, but indeed members that choose to turn a blind eye in this House. We talk about protection of the most vulnerable. I've heard it on every side of this House. But on an issue like this, those that cannot defend themselves, we turn a blind eye. Shame, Mr. Speaker. Regulations which will allow abortion on request for first 12 weeks of pregnancy, abortion up to 24 weeks on grounds of continuance of the pregnancy, which would involve risk of injury to the physical or mental well-being of the pregnant uh, woman or girl. This legislative assembly has been held in contempt, and it's high time we recognise that. It is sad that in these circumstances we cannot uh, debate uh, legislation or put forward uh, legislation or amendments to this very issue. But I take cognizance of what my friend Mr Given has said, that when that opportunity should come, this party will not be found wanting. And I place on record to my constituents who have lobbied me on this issue and to the unborn that Member, I will never time is up. be silent on the issue of the unborn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And that brings this section of the agenda to a close. Thank you. Um, the next item on the order paper is a motion regarding committee membership. As with other similar motions, it will be treated as a business motion and there will be no debate. Clerk, please read the motion. That Mr Andrew Muir replace Mr Trevor Lunn as a member of the Public Accounts Committee. And I call John Blair to move the motion. Mr Speaker. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Can't really know. The ayes have it. Thank you. The next item on the order paper is a motion to appoint members to the Board of Trustees of the Assembly Members Pension Scheme. It will be treated as a business motion, so there will be no debate. I will ask the Clerk to read the motion. That this Assembly appoints Dr Keeva Archibald, Mr Pat Catney and Mr Andrew Muir as Trustees of the Assembly Members Pension Scheme. I call John O'Dowd to move the motion. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Can't really know. The ayes have it. Thank you. Point of order, Mr. Allister. Um, I rise for the third successive week to express regret that we are about to make significant change to the processes of this House without the opportunity for debate uh, in the setting up of this new committee. It may well be a very meritorious suggestion. Uh, I'm not at this point suggesting otherwise, but I think it is a fundamental flaw in the manner in which we're approaching these things that we are not facilitating and allowing debate on these matters. The business committee that brought this forward could at the same time have brought forward a motion to suspend Standing Order 12.7 to allow debate, but chose not to do so. And I think that is most a, a inappropriate and regretful. Could I ask for one specific matter? Can you tell us, Mr. Speaker, if the absolute privilege which applies under Section 50 of the Northern Ireland Act of 1998 will apply equally to an ad hoc committee such as this 
in this House. The absolute privilege that applies to every member when they participate in this Assembly as the Assembly, will that same absolute privilege apply to this intended committee? Well, the, the matter will be considered further, and if the Assembly is to approve the motion in front of it today, tabled by the Business Committee, and I would make the point that the Business Committee did consider whether to enable a debate or not, and they decided they were satisfied that they did not require a debate, given the extenuating circumstances we all are facing with the current unprecedented health crisis. So uh, further, issue, further guidance will be issued if the Assembly votes to approve this motion, and I'll make some remarks to that later on. Thank you. The next item on the order paper is a motion regarding the establishment of an ad hoc committee on the COVID-19 response. The motion will be treated as a business motion, and therefore there will be no debate. Clerk, please read.